right now it is time to switch gears. We are right here on the main stage and we have our keynote speaker. We have been waiting for this all day and I know you are just as excited as we are to have the opportunity to hear Mrs. Tina Perry, president of the Oprah Winfrey Network. She has a huge heart and loves giving back and mentoring youth. So we are so honored to have her here and share words of wisdom. We've been waiting for this all day. Thank you so much, Tina, for being with us. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to be here with you all today. Ideally, I would love to be with you in person, sitting face to face in a big conference room in downtown New York City, uh, with coffee in the back, snacks on the side. But instead, this session is brought to you by StreamYard. And as an aside, I must say that Prior to COVID, I had done exactly probably two Zoom blue jean type virtual meetings. I was a very one-on-one, -on -one, face to face person. I liked picking up the phone. But as of today, over a four month span, I do five to six Zoom calls per week. I'm sorry, five to six Zoom calls per work day, roughly 25 to 30 Zoom calls per week. So I've now Zoomed to well over 400 sessions, but who's counting? But in all seriousness, I wanna thank the Emma Bowen Foundation for uh, this lovely StreamYard presentation option for this virtual keynote. Um, I had never heard of StreamYard, but I have to say that since I am a frequent Zoomer and just kind of bland square boxes get kind of boring, it's fun to see a new technology and a way to present um, Zooming, you know, virtual interactions with people. So I'm, I'm really excited to learn that today. And kudos to you for finding this great new technology. First off, how are you all today? How are you all managing during these challenging times? I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy. I hope you're staying sane. Um, and I know at the very end of this, we're going to hold a Q&A. So I want you to write down your questions while I'm talking, um, and I look forward to hearing uh, questions I can answer for you. Okay, let's get started. Juliana, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I oversee all business and creative at OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. Like many other businesses, OWN has faced significant challenges during the past few months. As an example, due to COVID-19, on March 13th, we officially closed our West Hollywood offices and all of our employees began working from home. We also stopped down all of our production that week. This was a first in Owens history. It was a first in our corporate parent Discovery, Discovery's history. And I think it was a first in the industry. Everywhere, productions shuttered. And as many of you also experienced a shift from in-class to in-home, at-home studies, there's a big difference, I'm sure you know, working, you know, via Zoom, Slack, FaceTime, phone calls, text messages all the time versus being able to meet with your colleagues in person, in the hallway, or in the cafeteria. I know at OWN, for me, we've lost a bit of our spontaneity on problem solving. Um, you know, the ability just to huddle a group really quickly and tackle and change strategy on something, tackle something or change strategy. You lose a bit of the natural daily camaraderie also. That camaraderie makes working in the office, working for a television network, or being in school really special and fun. But at OWN, we're making the very best of things. And I hope as we talk today that you will see the silver lining in the difficulties we are facing. And you will take away a few tips that can help you find success despite uncertainty. At OWN, we currently use, utilize a brand tag of See Yourself. This tagline was developed and rolled out back in 2018 and it speaks directly to our core audience of African-American women aged 25 to 54. 
for our network, providing a place where our audience can see themselves and our programming is essential to our brand promise. We strive to be a place creatively where our primary audience feels comfortable and at home. And I'm proud to say that we have done a really good job at producing compelling scripted and unscripted television programming for our audience. OWN is the number one television network for African American women. And we also boast two of the top four scripted television shows across ad supported cable for all women 25 to 54. So to give you a quick glimpse at what we do and how the own audience can see herself, I'd like you to take a look at our most recent network brand sizzle. It's going to give you a taste of how robust our programming is at own. Take a look. I think representation is pretty critical to not only people feeling seen and heard, but to real healing, communal healing. Oprah understands that and has championed stories that are inclusive and that allow folks from all walks of life and many cultural backgrounds and folks who look like all of us to tell their truth and tell their stories. Keep moving, don't stop. M O V I. Oh, that gets my unqualified amen. Get up. Greenleaf way. You never know what God will do. I'm empowered and I'm rising above. Move. It's a woman's world. Faster, turn it up. Stronger, burn it up. Better, move it up. Move. Work it, shake it up. Move it, take it up. Move. Get it, light it up. Move. I think sometimes we hear that there's a certain way to tell black stories. And that's just not true because you are creating a platform for different types of storytelling. I'm gonna show you how. Just watch me. You guys got a special sneak peek today. You're the first group to see that tape outside of the Yellen offices. We use that tape for not only moments like this when I like to talk to people about the brand, but our ad sales team uses it also when they're on the street talking to brands that want to be partners with us. Now, as you can see, we create and distribute a great deal of content. And our programming runs the gamut from smart scripted dramas to lighthearted relationship-centric reality shows to informative talk-based programming. And of course, all of our programming is presented via the curatorial lens of our network namesake, CEO, and my boss, Ms. Oprah Winfrey. Now, I'm thinking about this year's conference and the theme, refocusing our lens. I thought about the ways that my industry has changed particularly in relation to COVID-19 and the calls for greater social and racial justice reform in the wake of George Floyd's death. Recently, our business has faced significant challenges in advertising sales and our subscriber numbers. We've had to cancel numerous important events and promotions, and obviously we've had to change how we present the lifeblood of our business, content. Own has faced shifts in production schedules and processes. We've had to pivot to remote and virtual shoots. The words COVID friendly, it's a new term uh, that didn't exist before March, and we now talk about those terms regularly. And in all, there's truly no aspect of how we do business that has been left untouched by the pandemic and our response today to today's racial justice moment. But despite all of these changes, all of these unexpected curveballs, our staff, our company has responded wonderfully. 
As president, I'm very proud of how our organization has banded together to make this moment work well for us and most importantly, help ensure that this moment makes greater sense for our audience. So as you're thinking about how the past few months have affected your way of life, how COVID-19 and this American social and racial justice and awakening has affected your quote unquote plans. Please take solace in that we are all going through change together and that we all have our own unique capacity to become better people during this moment. Just as our own teammates have had to lean on one another in unprecedented ways, I challenge you to also lean into your classmates, your friends, your families, to not only receive words and wisdom and support, but when needed, to also offer a shoulder to lean on and a helping hand to those you care about. As much as we have already endured in 2020, and we all have endured a lot, each and every one of us, we are all a really strong bunch and moments of darkness are always followed by a little light. So I want you to take a look here at our Our A Little Light campaign. We launched this last March. Hey, own family. Hey, own family. What's up, own family? A lot of us are going through a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. Fear not, beloved. Trouble comes to pass, not to stay. Even through adversity, there's always a little light. Hang in there. We will get through this together. Sending you love. Mwah. Ashy hands and all. Wash your hands. Stay home. Flatten this curve. A special thank you to all the healthcare workers out there who are risking their lives every day to keep us safe. But from our family to yours, remember, we are stronger together. Thank you, own family, for bringing in the light, for being the light. Let's keep lifting each other up. <laughs> Together, we will rise. We all know this is how our faith gets tested. And even as uncertain as this moment is, this too shall pass. Stay safe, safer at home. Now, that piece I just remembered actually ran in early April. It was just as people were settling into COVID-19 quarantine. quarantine. And it was Owen's response to the uncertainty of the moment. It was our little way to inspire our audience and to comfort them in the midst of the pandemic. Now, the response we got from the audience on social, um, I received so many actually emails and texts from super fans. It was tremendous. Um, it was very clear our audience, our community was sitting at home and definitely worried and uh, just concerned and feeling down about the world and the future. And this campaign really gave them a lift. Now, something my mother used to always say to me, she's not with us here today, but I grew up with this saying, somebody throws you lemons, you need to make lemonade. Well, this is truly a lemonade moment. And oddly enough, this climate has created opportunities and OWN has pivoted to embrace the ambiguity in our industry. As you may know, COVID-19 disproportionately affects our African-American audience. So being able to produce shows such as Black Women on the Conversation and special editions that talk to our audience about COVID-19. Uh, we also produced a COVID-19 special with Oprah where she talked with experts and about the, the uncertain moment we were in and just how to stay safe. In Iyanla Van Zant, we produced a show, Iyanla Fear Not, where she calmed us all and gave us inspiring words in this frightening time. She really, all of these shows as well as Iyanla, helped disseminate important information to our audience. And it was amazingly important for us as a brand, but also for the audience. And although in-person production paused on several of our shows, pretty much all of our shows, we were able to shift to virtual shows with the help of technologies like Zoom. Implementing a cadence to develop shoot 
and edit virtual programming was a tremendous win for Ong that wouldn't have been possible even just a few years ago. So, as you can guess, creativity in this moment can be key and also be comforting. Just as we at Own had to figure out how to retool our business by doing things in ways we had never done before. I implore you to also face this moment by trying to tackle something that you may have never thought you would do. Now, this may be as simple as reading a book about a new subject, maybe researching and reading articles about a topic in media and entertainment that strikes you. And I mean going deep, going down rabbit holes, finding journal articles, uh, looking for people who give talks on it, uh, looking for books, anything you can find on the topic, but going deep. Maybe you learn a new language or a computer program. Maybe you just spend some time writing in a journal, learning how to be reflective. Or maybe you take a online class about writing a screenplay and you write a screenplay. Perhaps you take on a new exercise regime, regimen, or you figure out a new mental health regimen, take on meditation. But now mind you, none of this is required. We are in the midst of a pandemic and you may just need to chill. Do your best to stay sane, focused, and most importantly, healthy. But if you are so inclined, embracing creative outlets may be a great way for you to personally pivot and to find new ways for you to secure success during uncertainty. Now, as much as I don't know any of you personally, I know a couple things. One is that you all have a passion to enter the entertainment and media industry. And I know one other thing. That, that you are all drawn to this industry because of its creativity. Whether you want to be in ad sales, be a marketing exec, work in communications, develop and create content, maybe you want to do deals. It doesn't matter. I know that is something that drew you to this industry because creativity is the core and heart of the business. It's not just people on screen when they're performing. It's not just writers who are creative. Everyone in this industry must be creative when they do their job. So again, I want you to think about embracing creative outlets. It can be a great way for you to personally pivot at this moment and to find new ways for you to secure success during uncertainty. Now for our network, Memorial Day sparked a new resolve and a shift in our intent and in programming initiatives. George Floyd's death was an important moment in American history and OWN responded resoundingly. We have long been a network that placed an emphasis on telling black stories. We always knew Black Lives Matter. We loved presenting an accurate African-American narrative. But in this moment of social justice, it was important for us to look beyond just a conversation around diversity. We are already a very diverse company. And as I just said, we've been telling uh, diverse stories for years. But instead, we resolve to aid in helping people better distill what this moment means. And as a result, we produced very quickly a two-night special hosted by Miss Winfrey. It was titled, Where Do We Go From Here? and it featured black thought leaders. It was a huge success. It was the first time it's ever been done on TV. And I want you to take a look at this promo piece um, right now. Tonight, watching the life seep from George Floyd's body caused universal shock. The knee on the neck is so symbolic. We're just tired as black people having to prove our humanity. An urgent own spotlight tonight event. How do we protect ourselves, survive, and thrive? We must make sure in all this upheaval that we don't ask for too little. Where do we go from here? Starting tonight, 9, 8 central on OWN. 
Now, I'm not sure if many of you know what living life with intention means. But to quote Miss Winfrey, I don't do anything without thinking about what I ultimately want, the motivation. What is the motivation I'm putting into it? What is the end result going to be? I only do what I intend to do, and that intention precedes every thought and every action. And the outcome of your experiences is determined by the intention. In short, living with intention is living where there is focus. There is a drive. There is a purpose for your actions. And there's an acknowledgement of how your actions not only affect your life, but also affect the lives of others. Living with intention also allows one to place an importance on accepting what life throws your way and responding in a thoughtful, conscientious manner. This approach is one we embody at own, and one that I feel certainly could also be valuable in your lives. So once we saw what happened to George Floyd, and we saw the galvanized response from much of the world, we knew our intention and subsequently we moved into collective action. And I can tell you, I remember vividly the morning, it was about 6.50 a.m. Pacific time, I was on the phone with Miss Winfrey, and we were talking about what we wanted to do on air. And we talked about just this question, what is our intention and what also do we want to be the outcome or the impact of the show? For us, having a leader like Ms. Winfrey, who has a very specific POV on the issue, and who lives her life with intention, gave Own a unique advantage. Own served as a facilitator of dialogue, brought people together so that we could better understand important needs and demands and ultimately, we were able to reach a global audience by simultaneously airing the two-night special, not only on OWN, but also across the other 18 Discovery-owned television networks. In this meaningful moment, we were able to reach 17.6 million unique viewers during an important time in history. Now, I know this is an unprecedented time we are all living in. As difficult as it might seem to successfully navigate this moment, I would like you to know that each of you all have the tools to succeed. I know it, you do. The world has shifted, yes, but there is also an upside, especially if you take the time to lean on and support people you trust, think creatively about how you can own this moment better. And lastly, think about how you can aim to live your life with intention. I know that many of you are stressed about finding a job or internship, and that's understandable. But please know that you are not alone in this stress, that there will soon be a safe time and place for you to enter the workforce and continue to gain valuable experience. I know it, it's gonna happen, trust me. So. Although you may not have a formal work experience or internship this summer, that's okay. You can and you should lean into the Emma Bowen Foundation via the unique developmental experiences they have created. The foundation is there for each of you and can continue to be a valuable resource to help bridge this moment. I also ask that you stay engaged. And when I stay engaged, I mean, be active even when things look bleak. Whether you're actively learning more about an industry that you're interested in working in or if you're actively participating in the current political discourse through activism or through voting this November, it is vitally important that you keep your energy directed in a positive place. In the midst of change, you can also make change. So please do not discount your voice or how you can use your voice to uplift yourself, to support others, and to make it known that your beliefs matter. As you go forward, I want you all to know 
that there is literally no precise formula for success. And I'm going to say that again. There is no precise formula for success. So be confident in yourselves and don't be afraid to do you. In the upcoming weeks and months and years, you will have a lot of big decisions to make. It may be choices as to whether to take a gap year from school. Maybe you'll have to make a decision as to whether to change schools. What major to select, what internship to take or first job to take. You might have to make a decision about whether your first job after school isn't in entertainment and that you're going to come back around to the industry later on. Maybe you have to make a big decision about where to live. I could go on and on. But please realize that as you make these seemingly life-altering, make-or-break decisions, and I know how you all talk, okay, I want you to know there is no wrong answer. And you can take this from me. I'm 20 years working, and I've made a lot of decisions throughout my career. Jobs, where to live, what's the next right step. I want you to know, again, there's no wrong answer. Life is malleable, and very rarely is a single choice set in stone. The choices you face and the decisions you make are designed to fit your life in a very specific moment. Don't ever forget that. So don't be anxious about making a misstep or a mistake. I remember all the time I spent worrying about that. I wish I could get that time back. Don't be anxious about that. Just make your moves with assurance and make them with intention. Okay. I really want to thank you all for giving me this time to talk with you today. And um, I want to give you all an opportunity to ask some questions and also not to be rushed on answering them. So I think I'm going to turn to the Q&A right now. Um, okay. I think some of the, some questions are coming through, which is great. And I'm just going to slowly pick them off. Okay. What's your day-to-day -day like as president of a major network? Okay. So my day-to-days, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of pre-COVID. <laughs> Uh, because the same things happen. It's just not as many in-person activities, obviously. Um, it entails a lot of meetings, a lot of calls, uh, I'm making a lot of decisions. Um, I'm helping set strategy and giving my senior leadership team that is so important for the success of the network direction and answers so they can go execute uh, their work in the best manner possible. Um, day in, day out, I'm protecting the brand and I'm thinking constantly about my audience and my viewer. I have uh, several interactions with my research teams about ratings and updates and uh, studies, persona studies about my viewer. I'm constantly keeping her front of mind also as I'm making all these decisions. And I'm also thinking about the brand. Uh, there's also liaisoning with, of course, my boss. Uh, she is very involved with the network. And as again, it's her curatorial vision. So I need to get answers from her absolutely from time to time about how she wants to do things or, or, or what she'd like to happen. Sometimes I'm looking at casting tapes of people we hope to uh, put in one of our scripted series. Um, I'm oftentimes meeting with my creative exec and hearing from her pitches and ideas for stunts and programming. Uh, and then at a certain point in the day, usually five or six, I turn to a lot of emails. And there's a lot of responses to people internally and externally I have to get back to. So I'd say that's probably what my days are like. They move very fast. Um, they are very fun, but uh, there are a lot of decisions and shots to call throughout a day. Next question. What was the response by own to the second epidemic in our country, police brutality? 
Well, we quickly turned and produced uh, the two-night special I showed you, the two-night town hall with Oprah on where do we go from here. And in that town hall, uh, Oprah and uh, I think it was almost like a dozen thought leaders talked about what's next, what should happen next, and what should we do. Um, you know, we also have run a series of, of campaigns um, on air uh, dealing with uh, Black Lives Matter and making sure our viewers know that they've been heard and that we are aligned with them and with the movement that's happening in the country. Uh, we also uh, have started to make relationships and become allies with a lot of the people working on the front lines in the, in the racial justice moment that we're in. Uh, for example, in the Where Do We Go From Here show, we aired multiple PSAs uh, from like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the color of change to be able to get their mission and words out there. Throughout this time, we also have made a significant donation to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to support them. Um, and internally, we've been having a pretty incredible speaker series of bringing people in to educate our uh, workforce even more about issues dealing with racism, racial justice, uh, social justice. Um, so we're still in the process of, you know, responding. It's not over. Uh, we have some programming that we're in development on that that are in response to this separate second uh, pandemic, as you described it, uh, the second epidemic, as you described it. So we're still in the process, but we have had quite a bit of a response. Okay. What is the biggest challenge you faced giving people representation and how do you overcome it? So, you know, I think that uh, one of my biggest challenges is that I don't have unlimited amount of monies. <laughs> No TV network does. Um, you know, there are so many stories to tell, um, whether it be in the scripted space or unscripted space. Um, I wish I could fund them all. But the truth is I only have so many slots a year on my television calendar to produce new programming and to tell stories. And that has been slowly increasing over time across the network. Um, so I think there are absolutely more storytellers and more stories than I have space to be able to showcase or tell. So that's one challenge. Um, I think also in entertainment, finding those voices and storytellers, there is a bit of a system uh, set up where you can need certain types of representation in order to get to certain places and get ideas pitched, which makes sense because an ecosystem is needed in entertainment to prevent people from stealing ideas or, um, you know, people being treated unfairly when they present an idea. But really, you know, I think there's not enough representation uh, on that side when you get to kind of the agents and the lawyers of people who have those stories. You know, they're a little bit of a gatekeeper. And, and I think to a certain degree, there are some people out there that we haven't seen that that that's a little bit of a barrier of how do we get to them, how do we see them, and figure out if their stories are right for us. Okay, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self knowing what you know now? Um, so first advice is don't sweat the small stuff. I think it's very easy um, when you're in your 20s, I'd say, to feel that, you know, um, everything is going to have a dire effect or not be able to separate out what the small stuff is and what's the big stuff. Um, I mentioned a little earlier, uh, you know, those life or death decisions that you have to make, those big decisions that you wonder if you're going to make it, it's going to get you on the wrong path. I would go back and tell myself, you know, hey, Whatever decision you're going to make is going to be the right decision. And even if it doesn't turn out like you want, that job isn't the best job and you don't find the mentor you want. That decision to move doesn't yield what you think it would or create the opportunities you'd hope it would. It's okay because this is part of the journey. There's something you're learning through those moments that didn't work out as much as those moments that do work out. Lastly, I'd say I think that I would take to heart more um, a quote my mother always told me growing up, which is let every knock be a boost. 
And I heard it so much, I, I think, uh, tuned it out as I became an adult. But I will tell you, as I got into my late 20s and early 30s, I held that quote close to me. Because absolutely, there were challenges and disappointments and times when I didn't get opportunities I wanted. And I had a, it took me a very long time to break into entertainment. Um, but those knocks, uh, you know, creating them and making them a boost for me and not allowing them to, to weigh me down and stress me out, but realize it's going to motivate me and push me further. I would have started listening to that and kept that little sticky, that advice and kept that little sticky on my bathroom mirror uh, when I was 21. For sure. Okay. Someone's in a question that said they tend to struggle with perfectionism. How would you say you can over avoid overcompensating and stretching yourself out too thin in the workplace? That's a great question. Um, I think that it's very easy to obsess and want to get everything perfect. But the truth is, nothing is perfect in life. Um, I think that it's important to, you know, work as hard as you can, but you've got to create boundaries. You've got to create times for you to take care of yourself because believe it or not, that impacts the quality of your work. And I think sometimes when you strive for perfectionism, you can put so much into things, work so hard, work so many hours that you neglect yourself. And I think it shows in the work. Um, I think you have to accept that in the workplace, you know, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to miss something. There's going to be a typo. One of my favorite questions to ask employees when they uh, come to interview at own is, tell me about a mistake you've made and, and how did you handle it? You know, a lot of people are pretty shocked and afraid to like admit that they've made a mistake and talk about how they've handled it. But it's important for me to know that you own you can make mistakes and that, you know, you can come back from it. Uh, what I tell people who work for me is, it's okay if you make a mistake. You just don't make the same mistake twice. And I think that's a better way to think about doing your work and trying to get it as perfect as possible. It'll never be perfect. There will always be something that's maybe just not thought out, maybe something that wasn't right. You'll miss a little comma, a typo, but that's okay. As time goes on, you'll get better. But um, that, that's what I'd, I'd say about perfectionism. Okay, how do you, how are you exploring new technology to continue with creating programming during this time? Who are the best decision makers at the network to share such platforms with? So, you know, my head of operations and my production teams are really critical for looking for those new technologies. Um, and right now there aren't a lot of new of them popping up, but there are some. Um, you know, they, I think the people who are actually working in the space of making or operationally helping us all, um, you know, uh, uh, really work in a seamless manner, they're really the best decision makers because they're living in the space of technology, and improvements. Um, we are constantly on the hunt for that. Um, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to roll out, um, you know, different ways for small groups, large groups to communicate. And I think, you know, one thing this COVID-19 moment is going to do is going to induce innovation. Um, I've seen it at own among my leadership team and employees that when we had to hunker down and work from home, there's a level of creativity and innovation people started tapping into. And I think on the technology front, as everyone has to figure out how to work faster, smarter, as efficiently as they did before with the barriers we're working with, there are gonna be some great innovations. Um, so we're always on the look for them, but I definitely rely on my senior leadership team as experts, certain parts of it to help lead me down the road of what, what makes, more, makes the best sense. Another example I'll give you is on my research team, um, there is innovation that they constantly find uh, on how to interface with um, the audience and get feedback. 
um, you know, we no longer can do in-person focus groups. So they've been finding new companies and technology that allows us to get real-time feedback, have people tell us about how they feel about shows, test concept ideas. So it's happening, um, but I lead it to the, leave it to the department leader to let us know. Okay, next question. Do you feel when touching subjects to create content that's relatable to the times and owns target audiences, such as the pandemics, the pandemics against racism and COVID-19, of course, it's best to remain more conversational and appeal to what people might be feeling emotionally. That way the conversation can touch on politics, but not become too political either. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that, you know, when we do the conversational um, type of programming, uh, meaning, you know, kind of talking heads, people, you allow everyone the freedom to really get their point and feelings across. There's really no soft scripted or sketching out um, when you're in that conversational format. Sure, emotions can come through. Um, but for the most part, we have experts on that are able to really back up their feelings with data or stats or their research. Um, and we find those formats are great because you tend to get a variety of different voices. Everybody's not always kind of kumbaya, you know, in the same, um, uh, you know, voice or POV on how to handle something. I encourage you all to go watch Oprah's two night, our two night uh, town hall that I showed you the promo clip on. You can find it definitely online. And because you'll see that the leaders on it didn't all perfectly agree. Uh, people had different thoughts and opinions about where do we go from here. And so I think those formats are great. And I think audiences are looking to hear how people want to address uh, the moment we're in. And I think uh, those conversational formats are fantastic. Okay. Um, my computer is about to die. So I'm actually giving a shout out to my husband who's watching and asking him that if he is seeing and still on, if he could please bring me a cord. <laughs> I'm so sorry to have to do that. Um, okay. So uh, next question. When you're in all predominantly white or all white spaces, what are some of the best ways to advocate for BIPOC, gotcha, and any other marginalized group issues often hidden to white men decision makers? It's a great question. So I think right now is an amazing moment in the entertainment industry. Um, I think that white people in particular have an openness and are uh, really willing to listen and want to hear um, about those issues that oftentimes have been hidden to them. Um, I know that, you know, I have had a plethora of conversations, thank you so much, thank you, uh, with uh, white male leaders in this industry um, who have wanted to talk about um, just some of the kind of issues I know you're talking about um, that maybe they had never confronted before, thought about before. I did a great panel um, a couple weeks ago. ITV is a global production company. They're based out of the UK, but they're everywhere. They have a very, very big presence in LA. And some very senior executives there asked me to be on a panel. Van Jones uh, moderated it, and it was myself, a writer, a creative exec and scripted, and a psychologist. And we were all African American. And what was interesting is none of us worked at ITV. Uh, we all had maybe, um, like, we have a show we work with them on, but I don't work in the company. The psychologist had never really met people there before. She was brought in as an outsider. But what was interesting is they really wanted to have a candid conversation with us for their employee base about, you know, some of the, the what you've raised in your questions, right? And I thought it was fantastic because they've owned that they need some work to do on the diversity and inclusion space. But they allowed us to have a real, real conversation and talk about um, those issues, you know, that maybe have been hidden or people didn't feel comfortable raising them. And what I found valuable about that experience was that since none of us worked in the company, 
We were not employees. Our bosses weren't, no one could retaliate against us. We can only tell the truth of how we see issues, um, unconscious bias, uh, talk about our experiences that maybe, you know, we didn't feel we were treated fairly, you know, and um, we heard that it had a tremendous impact on their workforce. So I think that now more than ever is an, an, an easier time to kind of talk about those issues. I think that you listening is as important as sharing and talking about them. I think having patience and um, also knowing that a resolution may not happen, that the person that you're talking with when you, you raise these issues that people have experienced and, and you talk about the barriers and the difficulties people of color have had, um, it may not click for them right away and that's okay. But the point that they're hearing it and that you get a chance to share it is progress. Okay. How would you say, oh, here's another one. As a black woman in the entertainment industry, how do you take care of your mental health? Well, I take mental health very, very seriously. My senior staff can tell you I'm constantly stressing to them to take time off. I'm pressuring them this summer to take vacation. I encourage people to block out time of the day, go take a walk. I'm so elated when I hear about, um, seriously, one of my senior leaders, like taking time off or even employees, because it's so important. Um, for me, you know, meditation has become um, something my husband and I have practiced more and more the last several months. I always meditated some, but it's been more of a constant practice for us. It's been a wonderful way to start the day or end the day. Um, uh, you know, long walks where you're not listening or thinking about anything. I mean, we go on long hikes out here in LA and it's like, you know, just be with nature and be in silence. Um, there's something mentally healing. I feel with that because we always have a TV on. There's always a podcast playing in the background. I'm always on a zoom. My husband always has something happening with his work. But when we take those long, long walks and hikes, and we are just in the moment of them, um, there's something I have found the last several months uh, that's very different than working out, than biking really hard or doing an exercise class that I have found has been mentally healing and important for me. Um, uh, and I have to be honest, you know, I think I'm, I'm a big prayer. <laughs> so I, I really infuse a lot of prayer into my mental health regimen. Um, so yeah, those are the few things I'd say. Okay. Um, are there any steps we can take now to get to your position in the future? Okay. Um, so listen, what I tell people early in their career is I think what you want to focus on is learning to work in, in learning to do good work. When you finish school and you start your first job, doesn't matter whether it's in entertainment or not, that should be your focus. Showing up on time, uh, building relationships in the office, really executing assignments, um, you know, in, a, in a, a great manner that it's, it's very clear how diligent you've been as well as how uh, much time you've put into the work, um, learning to be collaborative in the workplace, um, learning what your weaknesses are and being open to that and working on your weaknesses. Uh, honing your writing skills is critically important in your early years. Learning how to communicate um, as well as honing your emotionally intelligent skills. Um, emotional intelligence is one of the most important things you guys need for your journey. And I would say the moment you guys are at right now doing your internships and going into the workforce, you want to focus on those things. Now, of course, you're going to be learning about the area of the industry that you're in. Um, you may start to pay attention to other areas and think you want to go work and do in, work in something else. And, you know, I, all that is going to just be happening naturally, right? But learning to work and do the work well, honing your weaknesses, Understanding what your strengths are. That is one of the best things you can do earlier in your career. It was advice someone gave me um, when I started to go into the work world about the first job I was taking, which I wasn't jazzed about. It wasn't in entertainment. 
Um, I was going to do corporate law, which, you know, was a great part of my journey, but it wasn't the dream out of law school of what I wanted to do. And it was the best piece of advice somebody gave me for the years that I practiced corporate law, that those years were not, um, you know, my most favorite work years. They were tough hours and it was a lot of work and it was very intellectually uh, challenging. Um, I really worked hard. And I vested in that work. I didn't wallow in, I don't want to do this work. I don't want to be here. I wish I was doing something else. I really learned how to work and do it well. I learned how to, when I made a mistake, I didn't make the mistake twice. So that's the best thing I think you can do at the stage you guys are at. And then throughout those early years, those first four to six years, I think you're going to have a better idea of what you think you want to do with your career. What, 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 what do you want to be me one day and run a network? Or would you rather be an entrepreneur and start a business in media and entertainment? And that's your route. But it doesn't matter which route you go. You have to learn how to work, do the work well, and um, you, you'll be on your way. Okay. Um, what do we have here? How would you say you have maintained your creative side during such a bleak time? It's a really great question. So, um, you know, I think nurturing and maintaining your creative side, if you want to be in showbiz, is something you need to always be doing. Whether it's a bleak time or not, um, when I worked at my corporate law firm, uh, one of my best friends worked at CAA and she was an assistant and I would go visit her. And, you know, I would bring back scripts she had at her apartment and I would just read them at night or on the weekends when I was at my law firm. And it was kind of nurturing my creativity. Um, I remember, you know, taking classes on screenwriting. Uh, I remember one year going through a list of uh, the Oscars list of like best picture and best directed picture over a course of years when I was in my like early 30s. Um, I think you should be maintaining and feeding your creativity at all times. Uh, you can do that through watching content, new content, old content. You can do that by reading books about some of the most creative people there have ever been. And don't limit yourself to just one area of creativity. Um, read a book about Miles Davis's life. Like that is a really, his book, Miles, is a really great bird's eye view into a hyper creative person and how they navigated life with his talent and skill. Um, you can also read a book about somebody like Quincy Jones, who we all know is incredibly creative. And when you read his, his journey in Q, it's a very thick book, you are going to take something away and it doesn't matter if you don't want to work on music. And it's the same way as reading a book about David Geffen. Um, his journey as somebody who's worked across Broadway, film, and music uh, is an interesting journey. And to see how he navigated himself creatively and made those transitions, you're going to be inspired. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to maintaining your creativity, it's very easy to be caught in the moment of what everybody's talking about right now and what everybody's watching. I find that I am uh, really more inspired by watching a lot of older, critically acclaimed things that maybe I hadn't seen in a long time or even, um, you know, never saw. So, you know, in this time that does feel bleak and we have a lot of limitations on what we can do, go find that, find that AFI 100 list and go watch the top 20 films, right? Go find out what won Best Picture the last 10 years of the Oscars and what were the nominations and see how many you've watched. And if you haven't watched them all, go back and watch some of them, right? And think about it. Wonder what is the streamline through this? Um, see what won Best Documentary uh, of the last 10 years um, at the Academy or at the IDA Awards. Those are other ways to help maintain and feed your creativity in this time. Okay, are there any steps we can take now? Okay, I told it, I answered that one. Uh, next one, in an industry that is predominantly uh, cis, white, male dominated, what advice would you give us, give to t rising TV professionals that want to challenge the industry as we know it and push to highlight unrepresented communities and stories? So A, I'm glad this is what you want to do because we need more and more people like you. 
Um, B, what I'd say is think about as you're going into your career, where you feel like you can have the greatest impact doing this. So do you want to be an agent and go on that route so that, and decide that you really want to make sure that your roster of who you represent, um, you know, are, are from those type of communities or want to tell those stories? Uh, are you interested in, you know, really, if you want to be at a TV network and if you want to be a storyteller, you know, do you want to use the medium of unscripted or scripted? and to figure out how to tell those stories and help those people break through. I think once you figure out the medium in which you want to do this work you're describing, I think you hunker down and you learn how to do that work really, really well. And you take with you and keep with you this notion you have um, to highlight unrepresented communities and stories. Um, I think that you can do it in any part of the business you are. If you decide you want to be a lawyer, you can be at a, a decide that you want your practice and you know client base to be people that are unrep in from unrepresented communities. Um, so I love that this is what you want to do, and uh, we need more and more people like you. Okay, I have one last question. Uh, how has adaptability played a part in the different roles you've had throughout your career? Every job I have taken, um, I have had to adapt. Uh, at one point, my job was relocated to Los Angeles, and that I had to adapt. When I moved from my law firm to um, uh, the entertainment business, it was a big adaptation for me. I had to adapt in a big way. It was so different. Uh, when I moved from business to legal affairs, even though it was more operational and I went to run the network, there was, I had to adapt. And that is the name of the game. I think it's the name of the game in life. And I think it's the name of the game of this industry. And I think the more flexible you can be with adapting, um, the more you can expect it in your life and just be ready to, to make that change and roll with it. Um, it, it, it gets easier, but it's always going to be a part of your career. Okay, I think my time is up, I'm hearing. Tina, Tina, we wish you could stay with us all day. That was so inspiring. I have so many takeaways personally, and I'm sure everybody in the room does. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you, and I just appreciate you all again for inviting me. Um, as much as you just said how much you guys have taken away and all of that, I can't tell you what moments like this mean for me. I have vivid memories of being your age and with your hunger and your passion and your dreams. And I can tell you I would have killed, not literally, but to have the opportunity of an Emma Bowen or even this experience. And I just want to tell you thank you for giving me this moment because I need all of you to be in the industry because I'm not going to work forever, okay? So instead, hold fast. Hold on to your dreams, and um, thank you again for letting me today talk with you. Oh, the pleasure was all ours, honestly. We loved, every, we're hanging on to every word, letting every knock be a boost, not making the same mistake twice, doing what we intend to do. We feel so empowered right now, and we appreciate you for all that you've shared with us today. We will not let you down, right, team? <laughs> good, good, good. Oh.